Hello, I hope you can all hear me. Hear me? Yes, sir. And streaming also started, sir. So a very warm welcome, welcome. on behalf of NCRA to all of you who are attending this year's Govind Saroop Memorial Lecture. I think, uh, Shri Kumar, you may have both the Zoom and the YouTube live streaming on. Do you want to turn off one of them? Uh, no, sir, I did not. I only on right. Zoom only. All right. All right. So I don't know why there is still an echo. Okay, so once okay. again, warm welcome to everybody. We had started this annual event last year to honor Professor Suru, who passed away on the 7th of September, 2020. And the inaugural uh, lecture uh, in this series was delivered by Professor Ron Ekers. Um, our aim in this lecture okay. is to have a lecture by a prominent personality who has made outstanding contributions to radio astronomy, be it in instrumentation for radio astronomy or setting up of new radio astronomy facilities or experiments or in research work in this field. Uh, in the, uh, so this year, it's a real pleasure to welcome Professor Dick Manchester to deliver the Govind Saroop Memorial Lecture for 2022. Uh, Dick, who is amongst the best of the old timer experts in the field of pulsar astronomy uh, has also been a good friend of NCRA and Govin. And I'm particularly glad that he has chosen the topic of his lecture to be pulsars and the GMRT. Uh, the GMRT was perhaps one of the first interferometer facility to be designed uh, to explicitly support pulsar observations in different modes and has hence been making important contributions to the field uh, since uh, shortly after it was uh, commissioned. And I can think of uh, none better than Dick uh, to talk us through um, the kind of uh, things uh, that have been done with the GMRT and how it connects with the uh, global work in the field of pulsars. And I'm particularly grateful uh, to Dick for accepting the invitation to deliver this lecture at a fairly short notice. Um, and uh, it was really uh, very nice of him to agree to do it. And I know he's um, had to work that much extra to uh, make this happen on the short notice. So uh, thank you very much, Dick, for that. So without uh, much further ado, I will hand it over to my colleague, Palchandra Joshi, to formally start the proceedings for the lecture with a formal introduction of Dick Manchester. So Balchandra, over to you. Uh, thank you, Yashwant. Uh, uh, it is my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Richard Manchester, uh, fondly known to all of us as Dick, as the distinguished speaker for today's uh, second Govind Saroop Memorial uh, Lecture. Uh, Dick has been a pioneer of pulsar astronomy ever since the discovery of the first pulsar 55 years back. Uh, he obtained his PhD at University of Newcastle in 1969, working with Professor Elliot, where he investigated geomagnetic micropulsations. And then he began his career with uh, a pioneer of Australian radio astronomy, Professor Bolton, uh, with whom uh, Professor Saroop also uh, worked at uh, Parks in 1969. Uh, soon he moved to NRAO in USA for a postdoctoral fellowship and then on to a faculty position at University of Massachusetts till 1974, where a very fruitful collaboration between him and Joseph Teller led to the first book on Pulsar Astronomy. Uh, as many of us working in this field know, this book is one of the highest cited books in the Pulsar Astronomy. Uh, he returned back to CSIRO in uh, 1974, where he has been leading the astrophysics group and also he was an ARC Federation Fellow. Along the way in this long and distinguished career, uh, he was bestowed with several awards, the Hayden Prize Hayden in Physics in 1962, the Pauzi Medal in 1978, 
the CSIRO Medal for Research Achievement in 1993, uh, the Walter Burfitt Walter Prize Burfitt. in 1995, the Centenary Medal Australia in 2003, the CSIRO Medal for the Lifetime Achievement in 2007, a Distinguished Lecture Position in 2015, uh, Matthew Flinders Medal uh, in 2019, and so on, and, and so several on. other awards, just to name a few of them. He's also delivered several named lectures, including the inaugural huge lecture at Cavendish Laboratory in 2008. Uh, currently, he's a CSIR fellow, an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, and a fellow of Australian Academy of Science. Uh, in addition, he has served in different capacities on several uh, IAU bodies. Dick is a hands-on radio astronomer who started by writing a certain level code on a PDP-9 computer for, for the first time recording the Pulsar data digitally and has ever since helped in development of several instrumentation and uh, instruments, several types of instrumentations, even telescopes. Uh, he had deep involvement in the okay. development of Australia Tele Telescope Compact Array at CA and also the analysis software. Uh, throughout his career, he has led or played major role in discovery of uh, more than half the population of the Pulsar known as of today. Uh, in 2003, he started a precision timing project called Parks Pulsar Timing Array, looking for gravitational waves, an experiment uh, which may be poised for a discovery soon. He has developed a catalog of Pulsar, very widely used by all Pulsar astronomers, and which he maintains even today with great care and dedication. He jointly developed the Pulsar Timing Package Tempo and its successor Tempo 2, which is also widely used for precision timing and is one of the backbones of the Pulsar analysis. He has fostered international collaborations in different spheres, including one of the most pul successful Pulsar survey till date, the Parks Multibeam Survey, and now the International Pulsar Timing Array effort. So we are pleased to have uh, Dick here deliver this second Govind Saroop Memorial Lecture. As all of you are aware, Professor Saroop was a proponent of international collaborations and was also deeply interested in Pulsar astronomy. Professor Saroop, amongst all his other activities, initiated very early efforts on Pulsar astronomy using the UT radio telescope just after the discovery of the first Pulsar. And he and was very encouraging of Pulsar activities throughout uh, uh, the development of UTI as well as the giant meter wave radio telescopes. So in that sense, it is really very appropriate and fitting to have Professor Manchester deliver this memorial lecture on Pulsars in memory of uh, Professor Govind Saroop. So with that introduction, without further ado, I request Dick to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Balchandra, for the for the introduction. Action. Um, it's a great honor, honor to, to be at this uh, lecture, and uh, also nice to, to be able to follow uh, uh, Rogers in in this. Um, um, his office is just around the corridor from mine, so we we we're, we're good colleagues. We've both both been in here for a while, so um, yes, it's uh, very good. Um, um, so the title of my, my talk uh, is, uh, as already been said, Pulsar, Zars and GMRT. Um, my uh, research field, as, as, as I said, has uh, been Pulsars for a very long, long time. Uh, and so it was natural for me to con concentrate on It's also so that um, the, the person that this, this lecture honours uh, is uh, Professor Swaru um, envisaged right from the very beginning um, of the um, uh, uh, Indian radio, radio projects, including the and the GRT, that it, it, the, these arrays should be capable of, of doing, doing uh, work such as pulse pulsars, as any made that, that the provisions were, were, there, were there for that purpose. So, so it's a great honor. 
I remember uh, Govind uh, showed me over the the, uh, the array. I think about 15 years ago, and and, and it was a great uh, uh, a great occasion. I don't remember remember exactly what it was, but I certainly enjoyed. It. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, move uh, move on. So the um, the, the book outline is um, uh, first. First of all, I'll give a brief uh, introduction to pulsars, uh, uh, and, and then um, for a few, few a little while about uh, Dr. Warup and his and his his um, uh, role in the beginnings of uh, of radio astronomy in India. In fact, uh, um, as I'll, I'll say, and then in the development of the NGMRT RT radio telescopes. I'll give I'll give some examples of pulsar science uh, with the GMRT and the upgraded uh, version of, of it, the UT. And go on to talk a little bit about future picks, and finally, finally, I conclude the short summary. Summary. Um, I uh, didn't quite expect, expect that to start so soon, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that's the sound, the sound of a pulse. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So, what it is a pulse? Pulsar uh, stars are rotating neutron neutron stars. Um, neutron neutron stars are a mass of stars, uh, mass uh, uh, a bit from the mass of the sun, but they're only uh, 25 kilos or so across across and. Um, uh, because they're so massive and so tiny, they can rotate incredibly fast, up to several hundred times every second. Um, through a mechanism that's not, uh, not uh, still not really understood, uh, uh, they radiate beams of uh, radiation um, from the uh, probably from the mole region, uh, like these beams sweep across across the sky. If it happened to uh, sweep, sweep across Earth, we see a pulse. And so as the star rotates, we, we see a pulse uh, uh, every uh, revolution. So, so they're, um, they're often referred to, referred to as uh, lighthouses in the sky, sky the analogue of a, a lighthouse and it's a rotating beam uh, forming a pulse of, of, of light. So you, you've already, already heard of a pulsar. That, that, that pulsar is... Um, Pulsar. It's a southern, southern, strong southern hemisphere pulsar that was discovered back in 1968 uh, at Malongolongolo. And, it, and it, it, it has a period of just a bit less than a tenth of a second. Um, and uh, uh, it, uh, it makes a great recording. So I'll just play a little bit more of, of that. Um, So you can hear that the uh, the pulse um, uh, the pulses are, are, quite, are quite a regular strength, but, but the great thing about pulsars is, is that though they vary a lot, vary a lot pulse to pulse, facing between the pulses, which is known as the pulsar period, is incredibly stable, and especially for urban pulsars, which I'll describe later on. Um, that property property is um, incredibly useful, useful for a huge number of, of applications in in uh, in physics and astro astrophysics, very fundamental studies. So it's become very important important largely for that for that re reason. Um, new new as a compact remnant remnants of super explosions in a silver the. In a part of a massive mass of star collapses that form a neutron star, and the outer part is blown off to form a supernova. supernova and one of the best known exa example of the remnants is the Crab Cra Nebula, beautiful uh, ne nebula. Uh, uh, that's uh, about a thousand, thousand years old. So um, the supernova went off uh, uh, about a thousand, thousand years ago. Young pulsar um, and young in this context is less than a million million years old. So these are astrophysical physical, um, ages. Um, the periods between uh, uh, point, point 0.1 of it and ten seconds. And, and the most of the known, known pulsars, often called called normal pulsars, are 
uh, are, um, and, uh, uh, are of this height. But there's a very important, important subclass millisecond pulse size. Um, many new neutron stars are formed, formed uh, in a binary system with a with of companion star. Sometimes that comes that star evolves and tra transfers angentum to the neutron star, uh, recycling because the pulse the pulse has probably been dead for a few million years, um, but it brings it back to life and form, forms the so-called millisecond second pulse pulsar, and these typically have, have periods between and ten milliseconds. Because of this formation route, uh, uh, most of the second pulsars are members of a binary system, system indicated by this aqua, aqua color. And as, as I mentioned, they have extremely stable periods. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, is, uh, is with the sky in, 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 in galactic coordinates. So the, the uh, galactic crater, the Milky Way, uh, it, it run this axis. Uh, uh, the galactic center is here, uh, and it shows it shows the the um, uh, the of uh, or, or the, the stars that uh, we know know about uh, more than three thousand three thousand now, um, and with color coding uh, representing the observatory, observatory they were discovered. So parks uh, an aqua color, which which is my favorite color. Uh, and the other observatory trees have various different colors. Arecibo, uh, in this region, is, 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 is red on. So, so pulsars are unique in, in that they've uh, 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 garnered two Nobel Prize prizes. Uh, I think you're to say that uh, quasars haven't garnered a single one. Single one. Pulsars have got two. two. The, the first um, was in 1974 to uh, to, to Tony Bush for the discovery of pulsars. Now, most people know that was fairly controversial. The person who really did most of the work is Jocelyn Bell, uh, shown here, and, and she uh, was not rec recognized by the, the Nobel Committee. Uh, she was really responsible for the discovery of pulsar, pulsars. And this, um, um, the top chart recording in here, here shows the uh, so-called uh, bursts of scruff. scruff. She, she noticed, and, and her, her the big insight uh, was, was he re realized that these these bursts were repeated at a, a sidereal interval, so so that, that they were related to normal normal time, ordinary time. They were related to the rate at which the stars go round around uh, the sky, and so so these stars they had to be outside outside the earth, had to be uh, something out in space. Uh, a month or two later, uh, uh, Tony Hewish and Jocelyn set up, set up a chart recorder. Uh, then the, the 28th of November, uh, and, and and time saw that this scratch actually consisted of a train train of pulses. So that was really the discovery of of uh, pulse, pulses. Uh, second uh, Nobel uh, Prize was prize was to uh, Joe Taylor who. And mentioned as a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, and uh, his student Russell Hulse, Hulse, and that was in 1993 for the degree of the so-called Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar, pulsar, and and all for the uh, the use, use that this uh, binary system has been made for uh, made made for tests of a, a relativistic. So Taylor binary 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 really has a, a list of, list of uh, amazing um, uh, attributes. Or um, it was discovery of a binary binary pulsar. It uh, pro provided this accurate accurate detections of uh, neutron star stars. It gave the first ob observational evidence for the existence of gravitational waves. And, and, and finally, it was a, a, a confirm of Einstein's general of relativity, activity, an accurate description of, of, of strong gravity. So that's an amazing list and, and the Nobel Prize for that discovery was, was, was certainly deserved. So moving on, moving on to radio astron astronomy in India, um, it all began in, uh, in 1961, more than 60 years ago. In September that year, um, 
TK Manan, Nana uh, T Krishna, and uh, Govan Swarup met at an I, I, uh, National Astronomical Union in General Assembly in, in, in California, California. And they got together there and there and they proposal for a radio astronomy group in India. That proposal was forward, forwarded to the group of the Tatar Institute, Dr. Homi Baba, uh, uh, in a remarkably short period, period of time, just a few months, he, he offered the four authors positions at the Tata Institute to plan development of radio astronomy in India, and all four accepted that. that uh, just a year later, the, the, the UTI radio telescope was conceived by, by, by government, and a couple of years later, it was, uh, was fund, funded uh, in, in, 19, in 95. A large area which Govan recognised was really important for many applications to give the give the, the sense of, and and furthermore, uh, his, his his really unique unique visions was he devised, devised economical methods of um, constructing antennas like this. It was design and it, it made it possible to build antennas like this uh, in in the Indian environment. So the main science goal of UTI was to see lunar occultations to get uh, high angular regular resolution at a low radio frequency, and I've been very successful at that. Uh, um, the pulse I work at UTI and he include interstellar scintillation studies by Krishna Kumar and others, uh, and also and also uh, section of um, and study of uh, period glitches. So UTI has has been a very successful uh, uh, telescope. Um, so, uh, some, some more in, um, in January 1984, uh, 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 but after the UTI had been uh, uh, built, um, Govan conceived the idea uh, of the giant, giant meter wave telescope. So, so uh, which is known as, as uh, EMRT, of course. Uh, he devised this. Uh, uh, so called, so -called strip mesh attached to road trusses, which has the acronym SMART, SMART antenna design. And he um, realized that that was a way of, of um, um, building uh, a large parabolic dish, 45 meters, meters in diameter, which is big, big, quick, um, a very economical way. So, um, uh, a year or two, uh, the, the GMRT was uh, approved by, by the Minister of, in, of India, and three years, years later, uh, it uh, was opened uh, and accepting proposals for, for observation from both India and, and, and Indian astronomers. It, ha it has two sort of, uh, not quite separate parts, so sort of overlapping parts. Um, um, the first uh, 16 nanometer and, and tell Y shaped array cover about 25 kilometers. kilometers so it's a fairly uh, wide space spacing and so it's high angular resolution. Then uh, another the group of antennas that were, were concentrated in a central core over, over about uh, kilometers. So that gives good sensitivity of a fairly wide uh, field of view. You often need for especially, especially for for uh, searching for an object such as such such as pulsars. It was a very versatile and high sensitivity instrument that was really well suited to pulsars. pulsars. About, about twenty years ago, the uh, the uh, upgrade to the GM GMR, known as the GMRT, uh, was opened. This had. Uh, Developments in the signal process processing system to allow uh, multiple modes of um, of uh, broadband, um, uh, in both interferometric and tight array opera operation. Uh, and and um, the availability of all these features, uh, which, which were fore foreseen by, by Govan and, and, and planned for, showed really uh, remarkable. Uh, all, uh, 
And this day, the, the, the GMMRT is the largest collecting area of any radio teleotel over the land from 130 to 14 foot megahertz. So that, that's really uh, quite remark remarkable. Um, so I'm going on now to, to a few um, uh, uh, applications of uh, the, the GMRT. Um, when uh, uh, bars are first discovered, they generally generally have, have poorly positions, basically the beam of the, the antenna that was used to, to find them in general, and that's, that's typically a large fraction of a degree. Now, especially for millisecond pulse, this makes precise time timing extremely difficult. Uh, you just can't connect connect the dots uh, with with a, a period pulsar like a millisecond pulsar. Uh, uh, such a, a poorly known, known position. So you need a long long time, twelve months, probably more, to, to get enough timing timing data solved for the position. And even that's quite difficult to do. So so. Uh, People at DRT, uh, particularly Anta Roy and Swagwadi Bagaria, uh, uh, realized that a quick method of determining arc, arc positions uh, uh, would be an extremely valuable facility for the, the EMRT. But they developed these coherent array mode, um, which enabled this using. Uh, a, te a technique called interferometric Im imaging. You you subtract the on pulse in from the off pulse in pulse image. If there's a, a pulse pulse there, you you find it. This was extremely extremely small and resulted in a, in a, a, a at least twenty reduction in observation time. So it made thing it made thing made things just hugely more efficient. So one pulsar that was discovered covered by um, uh, using using this te technique was uh, it's uh, done by its uh, course uh, course J 1120 minus minus 318, and it was just discovered in a 300 megahertz search of, of Fermi unidentified gamma ray sources. So I'll say more about the Fermi um, gamma ray uh, a little later. It's very weak. Only three microjansky, so 0.3 of a millijansky, um, and its position, position and uncertainty is big, about 40 minutes. So using this gated uh, imaging technique, um, Jayanta and Baswadi managed to uh, determine the, the uh, also position to uh, see to one arc, one arc precision, and they found they found this. 57 arc minutes for survey pointing center. That's more than the primary beam, beam of, of the uh, uh, incoherent search. So it was, it was a way off, right, out, right outside lobes, um, but it was strong, strong enough to come through and they, they were able to pinpoint it. So this, this is a, a wonderful example of, of the versatility of the GMRT, which was enabled by, enabled by his original design concepts that governed was uh, was largely uh, responsible for. So these accurate positions of over, over many new areas of it, for example, example of VLBI, very, very long line interferometry for astrometry to the positions and parallaxes and so on. And for the st stronger MS also enables uh, precision timing for, for, for pulse timing arrays, which are known as PTAs. Uh, and, and studies using those PTAs as of the Grotech background. So it's been an important uh, instrument. Um, uh, uh, some, some other early science with the, uh, the GMRT, uh, the, um, one of the papers was uh, um, by Lerma and her and uh, Mitra and Gupta in 2000, 2000. Well, the observations were in 2002. Uh, during the commissioning of the array, so they, they the number of they had available all varied a bit, observation to observation, and they and they used a total power mode with with six megahertz of bandwidth. Um, interstellar scattering is a phenomenon where where a sin which contains irregularities uh, in the interstellar interstellar electron density uh, uh, causes a deflection of the ray from pulsar. Um, and 
therefore, therefore, to get back to the Earth, it, it has to, to travel along a path. So that uh, spreads out, is out as compared to the direct straight, straight through path. This scattering is extreme, extremely frequent. And it goes it's something like this fourth power of, of the frequency. And, and see that here in these plots. At, at two, three, the pulse is, is really smeared out uh, with a long scattering tail, whereas at the high, at the high frequency, uh, you see the, the pretty much intrinsic pulse shape. shape. So these, so these uh, observed spectral indices, these were shown to be broadly consistent with, with the, the famous Kolmogorov theory for, for scattering, with a slope of minus four, four point. Um, Luma and, and uh, uh, Mitra also recognized that, that uh, for higher DM pulsars, which are further away, the, the, the slope uh, was a bit flatter. I speculated that the stellar medium in the, in, in the in the inner regions of the gal galaxy had had rather different uh, properties, which is which is almost certain. Another observation, which, uh, remarkable observation, set, set of observations actually, which um, which uh, show the versatility of, uh, of uh, the GMRT were, were made by uh, Bashwadi. Uh, Charya, Yashwant, Yashwant, and, and uh, Jan Gangil uh, in um, well, it was August in 2009. Uh, it was also uh, BB 18, 18 minus 14, and it made you made you phase array modes at, at, at uh, what is it five different frequencies across the GMRT band. They record, recorded at full population, and they also also. Uh, uh, had coded edition of the, of the 16 megahertz baseband data. So it's a, a wonderful data set uh, with a huge amount of information in it. They showed that there was, was a constant profile evolution with, with frequency, including both, both uh, intrinsic variations, effects of interstellar scatterings. So you can show that here's a scattering tail at the, the, the um, lowest frequency. Uh, pulse shape also changes just quite a bit as you move move from low frequencies to, to high high frequencies and intrinsic um, uh, change in the change in the so that can be studied to, to um, in, inside the pulse emission process and the the recording of the polarization data enabled uh, um, more investigation of that and of that allowing fits of, of the so-called magnetic pole or heading vector model to the polar polarizing variations through through this, and that tells you, you something about angle of the magnetic axis with respect to our to our light and and, and uh, they observed this incredibly complicated uh, uh, subpulse drift drifting behavior in this uh, pulsar, which, example of which is which is. She, this is really an, really an amazing question. It's absolutely, I think it's probably unique. Um, this pulsar ha has two main components, as you can see up here. Uh, and in its um, components, since the pulse drifts toward later the time at, uh, as you uh, 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 sub pulses. So this is known as, known as sub pulse drifting. In the main components, the drift is rather slow. But in between the two, two components in the sort of bridge region here, the, the drift is totally different. It, it's faster and it's more or less uh, linear, linear. Then there's what's, what's called a nut here where the pulse just, just drops out a little while. This is a very short one. one. And then when, and when it back, the behavior of the pulse is totally different, which is amazing. And it had suffered what's a mode change. So you can see there, there's a new component out here uh, uh, in front. The trailing, the trailing current has also been modified. By, and the drifting shows this remarkable change in slope. In slope uh, you, go, you go through the burst of pulses. It's off um, uh, uh, fairly fast and then slowing, slowing up. And then there's another, another somewhat long hull and it goes back to more or less the normal state. So. It's just an incredible observation, and it uh, gives gives a lot of, lot of uh, all these things together give a lot of, in, of insight into the pulse emission, pulse emission uh, process in pulse, which despite 
more the years of study uh, is still really understood. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's understood, but but not but not understood. <clears throat> um, just uh, 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 pulsar with the GMRT uh, was of a pulsar associated with the globular cluster. cluster. The primary beam of the, the GMRT quite nicely fitted the, the size of, of, tip, of typical clusters. And, and uh, Paul Era and Yashwant and, and uh, um, used observations at 327 uh, uh, megahertz uh, in 2003, so it was quite early, quite early, um, um, to, uh, and discovered uh, this pulsar. pulsar. Very interesting in, uh, pulsar. It, it has a 19-day eccentric orbit, but the eccentricity is is, is just 0.9. Uh, at the time, it, it uh, was the largest, uh, the most eccentric uh, pulsar binary system known. The pulse period is about five milliseconds, so it was a millisecond second pulse. And in the timing, uh, Rodolfi showed that the, uh, the the system was a prob probable neutron star system. Uh, that's two two neutron stars in orbit and orbit or another, often in quite quite tight, tight like this one. Um, and uh, these, do these double neutron star systems, is it called, called DNS systems for short, uh, are very important because they say uh, tests of, of, of the theories of this gravity. Um, the next uh, discovery uh, uh, was uh, found in a somewhat similar search, uh, 1833 minus 1034. But this time, rather than Golden Globular Cluster, uh, Gupta and a searching uh, super remnants, which also have, have about size compared to the primary. primary um, and they used uh, a phased array to array mode at 10 megahertz with an observation in 2005. They discovered uh, this pulsar. It's um, it's 5,000 years old, which by pulsar standards is it's, it's pretty young. Has a period period of, of, of six milliseconds. And one of the really interesting things about things about pulsar is that is that it has frequent period glitches, very very frequent glitches, four and five years, whereas a so roughly one a year. One a year. Um, and these glitches are one of the few ways that you, that you can uh, sort of dig into the, the neutral interior uh, and uh, uh, try to um, um, get information about, about uh, the, the content uh, of the, uh, the neutron star and star interior, the equations of state and so on and so forth. So it also was an important discovery. Now I, I mentioned the, um, uh, at the start, so this slide, this slide uh, concerns um, um, uh, uh, observations that uh, began uh, or begin begin with the uh, space space uh, observations with the the Fermi gamma ray telescope. telescope. So, so the uh, Fermi uh, was uh, launched from Cape Canaveral in uh, in 2000, and it covers the end end from 0.1 uh, to 300 giga electrons. So that's a, that's a big, big range of, of energies. Source positions are localized to, to 10, 10 to 20 minutes. So again, it suits the prime of the GMRT very, very well. I detected ten, tens of tens of, of uh, sources. And almost all of those they showed were um, um, at the of, of distant and active flexes. Sometimes known as, known as ANs. Um, but a few of, of uh, these uh, systems, uh, the visible association, and um, it's possible that rather, that rather than being really, really distant, distant sources, they're actually within our galaxy and are pulsars. So if the so searching the unidentified uh, Fermi sources uh, has been a major in industry for the last few years and um, uh, an international effort. And it's um, it, it's uh, fired about 100 week, week uh, radio pulsars, which are mostly MSP. So it's, so it's been extremely successful. The GMRT search began in 2010. 
Um, tied array modes at, at, at two for C's uh, by uh, Bashwati and and colleagues. Um, and that was published in 2013. They, they discovered four MSPs which were, which were associated with the the, the firm Emmy uh, gamma ray source and another see that just happened to be happened to be field um, which were uh, not associated with, with the source they from the from the radio detection uh, uh, able to uh, me measure accurate pulse periods periods accurate positions uh, and this enabled a search of the gamma ray pulsation data for uh, for gamma, or gamma ray pulses. Now that, that that turns out to be a huge huge job. You need you need a you need a couple of supercomputers going going flat for a long time to to search all this Fermi data. But um, in fact, in fact, for all, all three of these, uh, uh, or the, the last three, in fact, I think it's all four. It's all four. Uh, they did um, uh, detect uh, pulse gamma ray emission. So that was very very successful. The, uh, the gamma, gamma ray profiles and, and the radio profiles, these pulsars, are, are uh, this one in particular, are incredibly complex. The, the sort of uh, little line here with the error bars, error bars is the gamma profile. And this shows two, two periods. So one, one period goes from here to, to, to here. And you can see that it's just components everywhere, right through the, through the poly. Um, the radio is similar, but has has a different um, pulse shape, and, and, and there's phase off phase offs between the radio and, and gamma ray files. And the, the, the low frequency radio uh, uh, file is, is this um, trace, which is, is somewhat broad order, mostly intrinsic broad ordering up, but there may be some maybe some in there too. So this is really challenging for models of radio and gamma and gamma pulse emission to get. I mean, it's certainly the magnetic pole model. model. Um, I have a pet, pet theory that I put forward about forward about years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, years ago now, uh, where I I argued that um, um, this emission was actually actually coming from light cylinder uh, and was uh, act actually stick um, um, enhancement of of, of uh, radio emission uh, of gamma ray emission emission and radio actually. Um, resulting from the relativistic discussion near the, uh, the where the, the uh, rotation speed, speed is equal to the, the velocity of light. So, so everybody uh, agree, agrees with, with that. I, some people do. I, I think it's a, it's a good one. Time will tell. Um, an, another say uh, done by the GMRT is known as the, uh, the, uh, the high resolution Southern Sky. sky. GTHRS for short, and, and it covered um, um, region of the southern sky down, down here at minus 40 to minus 54 uh, uh, of declination. I think, I think it's amazing, and again, a tribute to, to Goblin uh, Foresight, I think, think that the GMRT RT can see this far south. Uh, I mean, it's, it's right in our ballpark down here. We don't expect northern hemisphere to, to, to encroach, encroach on it. But the the GMRT um, and it, uh, this survey, survey complements uh, a couple of grant surveys, the GDBNCC one and, the, and another one, another one to be T three hundred and fifty. Uh, in two thousand and thirteen, discovered ten uh, pulsars, and the, and they're shot by the red dots on, on on this plot. That had gone up by um, two thousand and two to eighteen. And must have a, a measured accurate position. Particularly interesting, interesting one is this one, uh, 15, 15, 16, minus 3. It has a, a, a pulse period of 36 milliseconds, which is interesting right from the start. But it's also, also a member of a very long period, long period binary system, um, 228 day binary system. And shows the variation in pulse pulse period uh, through the uh, several binary orbits. It's most likely a, a, re, a resump pulsar, which I mentioned uh, um, at the beginning, uh, due to the mass accretion or really angular momentum accretion from from orbiting companions to star. And, and the print companion could either, could either be a dwarf or a low mass neutron star. It's not it's not known at this stage. 
So in order to further to further investigate that, um, better localization of, of the pulsar, long-term precision time, and 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 if you could get a, get an optical ID uh, for the companion, that that would really pin it pin it down. This uh, so study study of bioevolution is a very very active uh, field in in, in in physical research research. So uh, these sorts of discoveries are important in constraining the ideas is uh, many uh, many, uh, many ideas being put forward. Moving on now to pulse pulsing arrays. Um, PTAs for sure. Um, it's confusing to many people. People PTAs are not uh, an, an array of types. They're actually an array of pulsars, pulsars in particular of millisecond pulse and pulsar, uh, which are wi widely separated in the sky, each with a long sequence of, of timing observations. These PTAs are sensitive to ultra low frequency, frequency gravitational waves that have periods of years to decades. So a very long period, um, very, very low period. Uh, uh, gra gravitations are often known as ripples in, in space. And they, and they noted back in 1915 by Einstein's theory of uh, general activity. And since then, by many, by many hours of relativistic gravity. Actually, observations of, of these uh, double neutrons, neutron systems have shown that Einstein, Einstein got the first time, and, and most of these other theories have been have, can be shown to 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 be able to account for for the options. So uh, it's pretty amazing. Amazing, right at that, Einstein managed to come up with the the right um, uh, theory. I think his is in Govins in insight must be in the same plane. I think. <coughs> uh, uh, the most likely detection for false timing arrays is uh, what's known as a stochastic, stochastic gravity wave background. This is a, a general background in the sky, in the sky coming from supermassive binary, binary poles that are in the core of very, very distant galaxies, some right back at the, at the, at the beginning of this. Um, uh, and uh, in order in order to detect these things, we need need timing data for at least 20 MPs over at least 10 years. And as Belchander and mentioned, we we're optimistic that we're going to detect this signal feeling. We haven't yet. The uh, this um, uh, GWB uh, brand uh, sources is uh, be different to those. Of uh, gravitation, gravitation bursts that are detected by the by the laser interferometer system, such as LIGO and Virgo. Um, these bursts just last last for a few seconds. Originate in, in coalescence of double neutron star stars, so they have the pulsar the pulsar action there, uh, um, and uh, in, in some cases the black hole systems, which are in uh, more local more local gal galaxies in in the local local group and a bit beyond. So they're they're um, very, very uh, uh, important in science, which is a huge field of, of current research at the moment. And hoping that the PTTAs will make a significant can contribute to that soon. So <clears throat> the IPTA is a development of the PTTAs, and it, it's uh, sometimes known as a consortium of consortia. So each, so each PTA is actually a consortium on its own because it's a combination of groups from different parts of some region or, or, or country. Um, and um, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, first uh, proposed uh, at a meeting in Arecibo by, um, um, what's her name, Andrea Lohman uh, back in 2008. And, uh, and its aim, aim uh, right from the start was to facilitate collaboration between PTAs and promote pro progress of the PTA science goals. If you combine a lot of data, you, you can always be better. And so combining all of, all of the PTA data is, is it's got to be a good thing. Turns out it's not easy to do, but if, if you manage, it's good. As well as uh, I work on that uh, uh, part of things. IPTA organize annual student workshops and, and scientific meetings. 
The last meeting, in fact, was at Puna in uh, in June uh, 2019. So uh, any of the people in the audience might have uh, been part of that. Uh, <clears throat> the the original all, um, members um, for the, uh, uh, the IPA were the European European the EPDA, the North, the North American PTA, which is known as Nanagrab, and the Parks. Uh, PTA, the PPTA. So the, the Indian uh, PTA, which is called I commenced observations in 2015 with the original GRT, and then and then 2018 or so has been on the upgraded uh, GMRT. Uh, just last just last year, the, uh, the the Indian PA was accepted as a member of the IPA. Uh, it used um, uh, simultaneous, uh, co coherently dispersed data for data for the two bands, um, 100 to 500 megahertz, and one up uh, around one and a half and a half. Gigahertz. Um, the main aim of the, the in uh, PTA is to do precision measurement measurement of dispersion and measure for variations to facilitate uh, gravitation, gravitation detections by the, the, the IPA. The Indian uh, PPTA currently ach achieved uh, extremely good, good precision, a part in 10 to the 4 in, in uh, these uh, odd units that, that we measured and measures in. And, and I think it's true to say that these are the most, most accurate um, measures ever measured. measured. And they were reported <clears throat> in a paper by Krishna Kumar, Kumar and others in 2020-21. A major issue in this work is, is the separation of true, true uh, DM variations from, from uh, extrinsic, uh, mostly scattering varia variation, intrinsic, mostly, mostly mode changing, pulse shape changes um, from the, uh, in, in the wideband pulse and pulse opening. And that's a challenging problem that's still it hasn't really been solved. Uh, excuse me. So, uh, the Indian PTA has also also become part of the of the square square kilometer. Now, now the square square kilometer array, known as the SKA. An international project to con construct the world's biggest radio telescope. It has two main sites. One of these, uh, uh, a low frequency array in Western Australia, and the other is a, uh, a mid frequency and ultimately a frequency array in, in southern Africa. The total aperture, aperture of both these is about uh, in square meters. That is one square kilometer, kilometer, which is obviously where the name comes from. And uh, the low frequency array space millions of uh, of elements, and the the mid bay uh, contains contains thousands of these these uh, these uh, smaller just there, eighteen to twenty meters in diameter, something like that. <clears throat> but this is this is a huge huge program, and getting funding thing for it is a challenge, which hasn't really really been solved up, up to present. The AIA is to find a uh, thing called Pathfinder to find a tell where ideas uh, that uh, have application to SKA can be tested out. And, initi and initially four of those, uh, one, one known as HERE, which is a, a low frequency array in, in, in Africa. Then there's, there's the Australian Pathfinder, SKA Pathfinder, known as ASCAP. Uh, here in the Australia, Australian. There's the Mir Array in Southern Africa, which uses dishes quite quite similar to those proposed for, for the, the essay. <clears throat> and then, then finally, Murchison Widefield Array, which has uh, the thousands and tens of thousands of, of, of low frequency dipoles to, to get the collecting area. Uh, uh, the, the India PTA. Actually, the, uh, the organization, the NCRA, became a full member of the, of the SKA organization just last year in, in, uh, in uh, 2021. The upgraded GMRT designated as an, as an, an SKA pathfinder, time to tell us officially designated uh, just a month ago. 
so it's very recent. The role of the Indian PTA is to develop and test, uh, to go monitor and control systems that that ultimately uh, uh, should have application to the to the SKA. So to to, to finish, uh, I'll just summarise some of the key points points. There's no doubt Dov and was a world leader in development of radio astronomy instrumentation. He, he, he just had uh, fantastic insight and knowledge. Uh, he was uh, asked and he was persistent enough to get politicians to pay, pay for what he wanted. Um, and um, that resulted in, in, in the construction of the GMRT and then before the UT uh, uh, radio telescope. Both of, both of these scopes were based on very, very innovative economical design principles that made them from in the Indian and, uh, context. And from the very, very old concepts Govan ensured, ensured potential applications, for example, to Pulsar research, but there were many other things as well that I don't know so much about, uh, were facilitated. It really, really showed uh, remarkable, remarkable knowledge of what was need, needed to to make sure that these, these things were going to work. And uh, Pulsar, Pulsar astronomy physics, certainly, certainly I, I know, have had to enorm enormously from, from, from efforts, uh, uh, both his efforts and those of his co colleagues over the past 60 years or so. Continued development of the rated GMRT and member of the IPTA PTA and the Square Kilometre Array Organisation. The future is really bright for Indian radio astronomy. So uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to give this, this talk. It's been here and uh, I hope that um, you've uh, enjoyed it. So thank you, thank you again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dick, for that excellent talk. Uh, uh, I'll clap on behalf of everybody. Uh, <laughs> Uh, th there are there is time for questions, so uh, the lecture is open for questions. Uh, uh, if there's anyone on the Zoom link who would like to ask questions, please raise your hand and I'll call your name. And we will also look at the questions on the YouTube. Uh, so please go ahead and raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Must have, been, must have been a very, very clear. Yeah, uh, so I, I see a hand raised. Uh, uh, Professor Panch Pakistan, you have a question, please go ahead. Please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Yeah, my question was rather uh, long range. Having worked in pulsar emission theories unsuccessfully, I'm wondering mm -hmm. why even after 50 years, the pulsar emission problem once studied seriously by Rutherman, Sutherland, and all these people, has really not made much progress. Is there a trouble with the electromagnetic background theory, or what is the problem? I think the problem is that um, you know, you know a, a rotation magnetized neutron star sounds simple, uh, but it's not. And uh, especially when you get up to uh, near what's uh, Called the light cylinder that I referred to earlier, uh, these relativistic effects and the just just the um, the geom geometry of the you know you know the on the magnetic field structure and the motions of charged particles through the magnetosphere, just, just ionals they flow in and when, what happened after that. It's just a huge a huge complicated problem and and you know. Uh, Despite the best efforts of people like yourself and a huge number of other other people over a very long time, as you as you mentioned, um, it's still an unsolved unsolved problem. It's it's just hard, and um, 
uh, you know, it, you know, it's the people who try to try to solve all but need congratulated. I, I think uh, for persistence, but so far there's a there's a uh, it's not really a solved problem at all, as you say. Thank you. I see another question. Amrish, please go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you, Professor Manchester, for a very informative talk. Uh, what I wanted to ask is you mentioned that uh, the, both the telescopes, the OT and the GMRT, are based on an on a design that made it very economical. So what can you elaborate on that innovation that made it so economical? Yes, uh, so <clears throat> there's certainly um, the, um, uh, one of Gavin Swarup's major contributions. He 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 managed to devise uh, um, the building um, these radio telescopes that were very uh, uh, lightweight uh, and really had some completely novel novel ideas that had never been ever been seen or anywhere. Um, and and this um, so-called uh, uh, smart um, method for building a GMRT telescope, you know, is a is a is a example of that. I mean, he somehow figured out. I don't know how he did it, but but somehow figured out by having a sort of flex flexible uh, uh, network of 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 ropes, basically, and sitting between them panels. Uh, that you could you could uh, make a, a quite an accurate um, par parabolic reflect. It's good up to um, uh, a, a gigahertz of wavelength. So it has to be, to be up to you know a better than a, a centimeter or two. Um, and that I mean that that's just amazing amazing that he was able to do that that and so he had a uh, enough. Um, I don't know what it is. It is an imagination or or some something to to be able to think of, of ways that, that this could this could be, um, and uh, it's um it's just all uh, credit to him then that he was able to do that. Thanks. That's very inspiration. Are there any other questions, please? Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Uh, any questions on the YouTube live stream? Uh, okay. I just checked. I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, if not, uh, uh, let's uh, let's thank uh, Professor Manchester for a very interesting talk. And uh, with that, I hand it over back to uh, Yashwant. Uh, uh, yes. Close a word of thanks and then close the proceedings. Yes, uh, so thanks, uh, Balchandra. And thank you very much, Dick. Uh, although we had a bit of audio problem with, uh, uh, which made it a bit hard, I think, for everybody to follow, but I think it was still a very interesting and useful uh, lecture. Um, and thanks for covering uh, the work that's been done uh, on pulsars using the GMT. And like I said, thank you very much for agreeing to um, give this lecture at short notice. Um, it's uh, it was uh, uh, very nice of you to do that, and uh, just like to iterate once again a big thank you. Um, I did want to add that there is a 
a medal that we have for the Govind Suruk Memorial Lecture. So uh, you should expect that to reach you um, in a few days' time. Once it is ready, we will send that to you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and uh, so once again, thanks, thanks. Uh, for everybody, to everybody for attending the talk, and thank you once again, uh, uh, Dick Manchester, for uh, for, the, uh, for the nice talk. Thank you, and I think we can uh, close with that. Thanks, uh, sir. Okay, so thank you, Dick, and and bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Hope I'll get over to Pune sometime, sometime soon. That would be nice. Uh, uh, come over.